Forming a New Nation. We start in Section 1 by looking at the Revolutionary Era. Our learning objectives are to analyze the ideological origins of the American Revolution, to analyze the Founding Fathers' beliefs about our God-given, unalienable natural rights, and to summarize the major events in the Revolutionary War. So we start looking at the road to revolution. The French and Indian War left Britain with a lot of debt, and they felt that the colonists should help to pay for the cost of the war, so they began to impose new taxes on the colonists. The Sugar Act was the first tax in 1764. It was followed the next year by the Stamp Act, which placed a tax on certain paper items that were required to carry a stamp. This helps lead to the Boston Tea Party. The Townshend Acts were partially repealed, but the Tea Act was enacted in 1773, further angering the colonists, and then a group of colonists dressed as Indians, no, uh, they were known as the Sons of Liberty, boarded ships from London in the Boston Harbor and dumped the chest of tea into the harbor. Now, of course, this angers Great Britain and ultimately brings a response that becomes known as the Intolerable Acts, uh, which were a series of laws to punish Massachusetts. And so in response, the colonies planned a meeting of all colonies to see what they could do to respond. And tensions continued to rise between Britain and the colonies. Uh, another incident that takes place is the Boston Massacre. The presence of British troops in Boston led to a tense situation. Protest led to confrontation. When rioting colonists attacked British troops, the troops opened fire, killing five colonists on March 5, 1770. Uh, now, of course, from, from the British perspective, uh, the troops were doing what they were called to do. They're just doing their jobs, and here they're being attacked by the colonists. Uh, and it's easy to understand maybe why they, they felt it was necessary for them to take that action. Uh, but from the colonial perspective, many colonists viewed this as uh, now they're attacking us. And so uh, this creates a very tense situation. So eventually they have a meeting of the colonists that becomes known as the First Continental Congress. In September of 1774, representatives from 12 colonies met in Philadelphia to discuss the situation. They agreed to issue a Declaration of Rights in protest of British policies, and they agreed to meet again in the spring. Now, prior to their spring meeting, the incident that has become known as the shot heard around the world takes place at Lexington and Concord. British General Thomas Gage led a group of soldiers to capture Samuel Adams and John Hancock, as well as gunpowder stored by the colonists in Lexington. Paul Revere and others rode to Lexington to warn the colonists. About 70 Minutemen confronted some 700 British troops in Lexington. A shot rang out, and the war had started on April 19, 1775. The British marched on to Concord, where they were met with a larger force of Minutemen. The Revolutionary War had started. So, as planned, the Second Continental Congress was held in the spring, but the war had already started. A government was established to oversee the war, and George Washington was named as the leader of the Continental Army to fight the British. Some delegates sent the Olive Branch Petition to King George III, to attempt to reconcile with Britain, but the king refused to read it. As the battles were intensifying, uh, the colonists were angered by the king's reaction to the Olive Branch Petition, and Thomas Paine's pamphlet Common Sense inspired the colonists to separate from Britain. So a committee, led by Thomas Jefferson, was commissioned to write the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration was presented to Congress on July 2nd, 1776, and was approved two days later on the 4th of July. And so now we begin to look at the war and how it unfolded. 
starting with the Battle of Saratoga. A turning point in the war was the Battle of Saratoga. General John Burgoyne implemented a plan to cut off New England from the rest of its colonies. Uh, his troops would move south from Canada and meet reinforcements. Reinforcements never arrived, and Burgoyne found his 6,000 troops surrounded by about 17,000 Continental forces. Burgoyne surrendered on October 17, 1777. Then we look at the winter at Valley Forge, which was the winter of 1777 and 1778. George Washington and his exhausted troops encamped at Valley Forge, which is about 20 miles north of Philadelphia, for the winter of 1777 to 1778. The harsh conditions led to the death of about 2,500. Thousands became ill because of diseases like smallpox and malnutrition. Now, fortunately, they were able to find a way to uh, inoculate themselves against smallpox. Um, it's not pretty, but what they had to do was harvest pus from infected soldiers and then they would uh, slice a little wound on the arm of, a, of an uninfected uh, soldier and wipe that pus into the cut. Um, and what this did is it, it of course would give them a, a light case of smallpox. Um, but the idea and the way in which inoculations work, it's just like getting a flu shot. Uh, except with a flu shot they use a dead virus but the body starts building up uh, antibodies to fight the, the pathogens or to fight the, uh, the, and the you know, in the case of the flu, it's a virus uh, or smallpox, to fight the smallpox virus. And so uh, what happens is that the body starts building up immunity to fight it off and then you become less susceptible to you know, further exposure uh, to, to the, the the virus. Um, so, like I said, it, there is a risk, of course, involved because when you deliberately give somebody smallpox, there always is the possibility that it could become a major case, but ultimately the inoculations were successful and really reduced the number of deaths uh, that were suffered there at Valley Forge. The American victory at Saratoga gained support from other countries, including France, who sent the 20-year-old Marquis de Lafayette to assist in the Americas. And Lafayette's troops gradually forced the British to the coast. Uh, British commander Lord Cornwallis took his army to the Chesapeake Bay, where they built a fort and waited for rescue from British ships. Washington prevented the British ships from rescuing Cornwallis's troops, establishing a blockade of the Chesapeake Bay. Lafayette and Washington's troops surrounded Cornwallis and his troops with a force of about 17,000 men. Bombarded by sea and land, Cornwallis surrendered on October 18, 1781. The siege at Yorktown marked the end of the Revolutionary War. In the Treaty of Paris, which was signed on September 3, 1783, Britain recognized the independence of the United States. So now in section two, we're going to be looking at creating a new government. Our learning objective here is to list the accomplishments under the Articles of Confederation and to describe its weaknesses. So first, looking at government under the Articles of Confederation. The government was initially organized under the Articles of Confederation with a single chamber Congress that had limited powers. So really what we've got here the Articles of Confederation kind of bound the states together in a very loose confederation. And ultimately, uh, there were numerous problems with this. Each state had only one vote in Congress, and there was no executive branch or judicial branch. Now looking at some of the achievements, uh, they did establish a fair policy for developing western lands, the Confederation government signed the peace treaty with England that ended the war. And the Confederation government also set up several departments and established the precedent of cabinet departments that were later outlined in the Constitution. 
Now, looking at some of the weaknesses of the Articles, Congress had no power to levy taxes, to regulate trade, or to enforce laws. To amend the Articles, it took the approval of all of the states. And much of the work of the central government was carried out by congressional committees since there was no president or executive branch. And with no federal court system, state courts enforced and interpreted national laws. And of course that meant that the laws weren't necessarily uniform because state courts might uh, interpret things uh, in a very different fashion from one another. Now another major problem comes up with an incident that becomes known as Shays Rebellion. And this starts with a former Continental soldier named Daniel Shays. Uh, Shays led an armed uprising in Massachusetts in 1786. Shays and his followers were upset by debts and taxes. Uh, Shays had not been paid for his service in the Continental Army, and he was unable to pay his debts. Ultimately, uh, the uprising is put down, but it creates doubts about the country's future under the Articles, as there was largely a sense that the federal government wasn't capable of solving major problems like this, and there was a widespread fear that we would continue to have more problems. Uh, so with no way to levy taxes, the government was not able to pay its debts, the soldiers went unpaid, disputes broke out between states, Shays' Rebellion, once again, as I mentioned, created concern that they would face more armed insurrection and that the government wasn't going to be powerful enough to deal with it. So the Confederation Congress called a convention in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. And now we're going to be looking at the Constitutional Convention and we will describe the compromises reached in drafting the Constitution. Many of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention had experience in politics and government, and many of them were signers of the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation. The delegates decided to give up their plan of revising the Articles and instead drafted a new plan of government. And here are some of the uh, ideas that were brought forth. Under the Virginia Plan, there would be a strong executive, a national judiciary, and a bicameral or two-house legislature, where each, state, uh, each state's representation would be based on its population. So the Virginia plan uh, appealed to much larger states because these larger states had a larger population. Thus, they would have a, a greater say in the governing of our country. The smaller states, though, objected to this, and they put forth the New Jersey Plan, which proposed a weak executive of more than one person uh, that would be elected by Congress, a national judiciary with limited powers, and a single house legislature where each state would receive one vote. Finally, uh, there's ongoing debate and disagreement between the large states and the small states. And finally, uh, they come up with what becomes known as the Connecticut Compromise. This proposed a legislative branch with two houses, a House of Representatives where each state would be represented based on population, and a Senate in which each state would have two members regardless of size. This plan balanced the needs of the larger and small states. And of course, this is ultimately uh, the plan that gets adopted. We do end up with a two house legislature um, where we have representation in the House of Representatives is based on the state's population. So California, as the, for example, as the nation's largest state, we have more representatives in the House of Representatives than any other state by far. However, uh, in the Senate, we're the same as every other state. Every state has two senators, and no less, no more. Doesn't matter how, what size your population is, each state is represented equally in the Senate. Other compromises had to be made as well. 
With regards to slavery, uh, the Three-Fifths Compromise allowed three-fifths of a state's slaves to count towards its population for representation in the House. Now, like I said, the slavery issue is a very divisive issue. Uh, many northern de delegates wanted to end slavery, but they knew that if they pushed the issue, they would lose the support of the southern states. So, but of course, the southern states, in terms of proportion, while you know, they didn't necessarily want to give slaves the right to vote, they did want to count their slaves towards their population. So this three-fifths compromise kind of somewhat meets in the middle uh, in, in the sense that, yeah, they get to count some of their slaves, but not all of them. Uh, ultimately, although I'm sure many Southerners uh, felt like they should have gotten to count all of their slaves, and many Northerners probably felt they should not have been able to count any, uh, ultimately, the compromise was accepted by both. Uh, another compromise pertaining to slavery was the Commerce and Slave Trade Compromise that allowed the slave trade to continue until 1808. And Congress forbade the taxing of exports and was granted the power to regulate interstate commerce and trade with other nations. Some other compromises that came out of the convention was a four-year term for the president, and an electoral college rather than the direct election of the president. And that still is in effect today. The way in which the electoral college works, this is kind of a simplified version, but basically a state's representation in Congress pretty much determines uh, the amount of representation that they have um, in terms of the electoral votes. And so when it comes time for a presidential election, what happens is that uh, in most states, it's a winner-take-all system. And there are a few states that kind of divide it proportional. But if you win the state, uh, depending on how the rules are, like I said, most states are winner-take-all, you get all of that state's electoral votes. So elections are not based solely on the popular vote most of the time. The candidate that wins the popular vote also wins the Electoral College. But there have been a few times in our history where the candidate that wins the electoral vote did not win the popular vote. And that always becomes controversial. Uh, still, many people don't like the Electoral College, but it's still around today. And once again, small states tend to favor it a little bit more because it tends to not wash out their vote so much. Um, so that's kind of the way that things, that things work. And that was, once again, a compromise that was set forth uh, that appealed to those smaller states. So now we really want to look at the debates that centered around the ratification of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So what develops after this Constitution has been drafted is a debate between the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. Uh, the Federalists supported the Constitution feeling that we needed to have a strong central government or the country would slip into anarchy. Uh, the Anti-Federalist, however, opposed ratification, feeling it gave too much power uh, to the federal government, and some argued that they had no authority to replace the Articles. And so they really felt it took power away from the states. And so ultimately, uh, there's this ongoing debate. Finally, the Federalists promised to add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. And when they made that promise, uh, soon after the the Constitution was ratified. So Congress met for the first time in New York City in 1789 and soon after George Washington took the oath of office as the President of the United States. And in fact that building uh, where Washington was sworn in is uh, there's still a building standing there and there's a statue dedicated to it and it is um, right at the end of Wall Street uh, literally, you could stand right in front of that building, right by the statue, and see the New York, the, the New York Stock Exchange from that location. 
Uh, so New York is a, a very historic city and kind of served basically as the nation's capital early on. Uh, of course, Philadelphia also played a major role, but Philadelphia and New York were both kind of heavily involved uh, in, in the founding of our nation prior to the country deciding to purchase a tract of land from Virginia and create a district that is not a part of any state. That is currently known as the District of Columbia, and that's where our nation's capital, the city of Washington, in the District of Columbia is located there. And now we move into Section 3. Our learning objectives here in this section are to describe the major differences between the first two political parties, to explain why the case of Marbury versus Madison was significant, and to explain the causes and the effects of the War of 1812. So we start by looking at Washington's cabinet. One of the first things that Washington did was to appoint his cabinet members uh, that serve as advisors to the president. One of his appointments was Alexander Hamilton, who was appointed to the office of the Secretary of the Treasury. Hamilton was a Federalist and believed that the country needed a strong central government. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison disagreed with the Federalist, and they came to lead the Democratic Republicans, which was the other political party. The Judiciary Act of 1789 set up the judicial branch with a six-member Supreme Court. There would be one Chief Justice and five Associate Justices. Now, ultimately, Congress really has the power to determine the number of just Justices on the Supreme Court. It has expanded to nine, and it has been nine for a long time. Um, district courts and courts of appeals were also set up, and John Jay was appointed by Washington as the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And now we look at Hamilton's financial plan. Uh, the three major steps to Hamilton's plan were, one, uh, the federal government should assume the debt of both state and national debts. So as whatever debt the national government already had, the national government would still be responsible for that, but he also felt that the national government should take over uh, the debt of the individual states. Two, the government should generate revenue by raising tariffs, which are taxes on imported goods. And three, the creation of a national bank uh, and mint to stabilize the banking system. Now, this third uh, part of his plan, or third step, the creation of a national bank, becomes very controversial. Opponents of a national bank said that establishing such a bank was not an enumerated power, or a power specifically mentioned in the Constitution. Hamilton said that the necessary and proper clause created implied powers, or powers that are not listed in the Constitution, but are necessary for the government to function. The division led to the creation of the first two political parties, the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson and the Federalists under Hamilton. And so, at the time, Jefferson, uh, in particular, argues that the creation of a national bank um, you know, once again, violates the Constitution because they have no authority to do so. And, of course, the, you know, the argument of Hamilton that the necessary and proper clause, sometimes referred to as an elastic cause, clause, uh, allowed the Constitution to expand and thus gives these implied powers. Now, uh, later, Jefferson, as president, makes a purchase known as the Louisiana Purchase, where he purchases a large tract of land uh, that roughly doubles the size of the United States. And in order to make that purchase, he actually uses this so-called elastic clause to justify um, his own decision as president down the road. But at the time, he 
remain very strongly opposed uh, to this creation of a national bank, feeling it was not within the power of the Constitution to create such an institution. The first major challenge for the nation at home was the Whiskey Rebellion. Farmers in, the, uh, in western Pennsylvania were angry over Hamilton's plan to place an excise tax on whiskey. In 1794, they attacked tax collectors and burned the barns of those who gave away the location of their stills where the whiskey was made. Washington sent the militia in to put down the rebellion and the farmers backed down without bloodshed. In 1796, Washington refused to consider a third term as president, and Washington, when he does so, establishes a precedent that is followed by, by future presidents. Um, it wasn't until Teddy Roosevelt that we had somebody decide to run for a third term, and the only person elected to more than two terms was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's cousin. And he ends up being elected to an unprecedented four terms as president since the Constitution has been amended to limit a president to no more than 10 years, which really only makes him eligible for two terms of their own. Um, however, um, that was not the case with Washington, but he makes the decision, and he really fears that you know, if somebody was to ultimately, uh, you know, keep continuing to be elected, that they could become too powerful. So Vice President John Adams was elected president, and Thomas Jefferson was elected vice president. The Federalist, to silence Republican criticism against them, passed the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798. And it became a crime to criticize the federal government and federal officials, which is really kind of hard to believe because uh, clearly the law is unconstitutional. That goes in direct violation of the freedom of speech protected in the Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, it's really kind of surprising that, that something like that ever passed, but it was. Um, also, the laws made it harder for aliens who typically voted Republican to gain citizenship. Then, uh, the election of 1800 was close and it showed a flaw in the system for selecting a president. Each state chooses electors that are sent to the Electoral College to vote for the president. In the election of 1800, two candidates, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, tied in the Electoral College. Now, the way in which things uh, initially worked, they, when they wrote the Constitution, they didn't foresee a two-party system. So <clears throat> the idea was that you would have different candidates that would run <clears throat> and run against each other for president, and that the candidate who took the most votes in the Electoral College would become president, and then the candidate with the second highest number of votes would become the vice president. Now, of course, once we have parties, this becomes interesting because, uh, quite literally, you can have the candidate with the most votes that becomes the president, and maybe a candidate from the other party becoming the vice president. But ultimately, this system was set up, like I said, not thinking of a two-party system. So, well, what ends up happening is because a two-party system really has evolved, Jefferson and Burr really are basically running on a ticket. Uh, the plan was for Jefferson to become the president and Burr to become the vice president. But they tie in the Electoral College because every, every elector that cast a vote for Jefferson also cast a vote for, um, for Burr and so those two both end up with the highest vote totals and are tied. Now when there is a tie in the Electoral College, it goes to the House of Representatives to decide. So they go there. Well, in, in the House of Representatives, uh, they end up tying it as well. Uh, they end up 
having to vote several times, and finally Jefferson becomes president by one vote. Now, of course, you might think, well, okay, you know, the, the people from the same party would probably understand that, that Burr was supposed to be the vice president, but the problem is the other party preferred Burr to Hamilton, thus leading to the tie. Uh, like I said, eventually it's broken. Jefferson becomes president by a single vote. Burr goes on to become vice president, where he would have an infamous duel with Alexander Hamilton, where he would shoot and kill Hamilton. Um, so for those of you that may think that Dick Cheney was the first sitting vice president to shoot somebody while in office, uh, that is not the case. Um, that was actually Burr. Now we look at Jefferson's presidency. And we start really with the case of Marbury versus Madison. Um, <clears throat> so in this Supreme Court case, the court asserts its right of judicial review, which is the power to decide whether or not laws passed by Congress are constitutional. Now the reason that this is significant is that uh, although it was expected that there, you know, that laws had to be constitutional and that the court could rule them uh, null and void. Uh, that power was not expressly stated in the Constitution. And so the Supreme Court asserts its right and establishes a precedent. And that comes to follow. Ever since then, now people look to the Supreme Court to determine whether or not a law is constitutional. Also, in 1803, Napoleon was attempting to conquer much of Europe and needed funds. So he offered to sell the Louisiana Territory to the United States. Now, it's important to note that if you look at, at a current U.S. map, you may see Louisiana isn't that big. Well, the Louisiana Territory included much more than just the present state of Louisiana. This purchase from France uh, doubled the size of the United States. And so we paid France $11.25 million and took over French debts of about $3.75 million. So all in all, uh, about $15 million are, are spent to purchase the Louisiana Territory. And like I said, this doubles the size of the United States. I already alluded to it as being um, so, you know, where Jefferson had uh, quite ironically used the uh, so-called elastic clause to justify this purchase, even though, of course, when Hamilton wanted to create a national bank, he was opposed to the idea that there were uh, implied powers in the Constitution. And now this brings us to the War of 1812. With France and Britain at war during the Napoleonic Wars, Britain began the policy of impressment, or capturing American sailors and drafting them into the British Navy. Angry congressmen, known as war hawks, began calling for war. Soon, we were once again at war with Britain. The war was fought at sea and on land between Canada and Louisiana. The British even burned the White House, but General Andrew Jackson led his troops against a large British force in New Orleans and defeated the British. The war firmly established the United States and ended the Federalist Party who opposed the war. 